Twitter in media partnership. Um, he used to work also for Current TV. Current TV, which was uh, Al Gore's uh, television channel, which he started up a few years ago, and uh, now working for Twitter. So, Robin, thank you. Thank you. I actually, I actually requested a, a giant touch screen to show tweets, but that was, uh, that was apparently not available, so to make do with notes. Um, welcome, everyone. Welcome back from the break. It is great to be here. Um, thanks to Al Jazeera so much for uh, putting this on, uh, specifically the new media team, which I've just been so impressed with as I've met them over the last couple of days. So my name is Robin Sloan. Um, I work on media partnerships at Twitter um, based in San Francisco, California. And I'm gonna talk to you about real-time information and relevance. And my hope is that by the time I'm done um, with my very short talk, um, you'll actually have a modified definition of real-time, real-time media. Um, I'm gonna make a pitch, in fact, and whether or not uh, you buy it, you'll have to, you'll have to tell me later. Uh, I'm gonna angle this talk at practitioners, people who actually do news, people who work in news. Um, if you're not one of those people, just imagine that you are. Um, you, might, you might be one soon. Uh, I'm gonna start by talking about Twitter, um, but then I'll go a bit broader as well. So just to sort of ground the conversation, let me give you some basic Twitter statistics. Um, we have 105 million users around the world, and that's growing very fast. 30% uh, of Twitter usage happens via mobile phones. That's both SMS and uh, applications on things like the iPhone and the Blackberry. Uh, we're actually growing faster internationally now than we are in the US. In fact, we have more usage in total internationally than in the US, although of course the US is still the single biggest country for us. We deliver a billion SMS messages a month and we deliver 60 million tweets a day, and that's also growing very, very fast. And I actually tend to cling to those statistics, those hard numbers, um, because when you go beyond them, it can actually be a little bit of a challenge to talk about Twitter, um, because many of you, um, maybe even most of you in this room, use it, you use it all the time, and frankly, you understand it really well. It's funny how these systems, uh, open, you know, technological, social systems behave. The inventor has an important role to play, obviously, um, but that's really just the beginning. And I would argue to the degree that he or she is successful, he or she doesn't really know a lot about where the system is going. Like Joy said, um, the things that succeed on the internet are unanticipated. And I guess I would add that their success is not even always understood. You know, Tim Berners-Lee is not the world's foremost expert on the web. So to be candid, we don't fully understand um, how and why all these millions of people use Twitter. In fact, you'll hear Ev Williams, our CEO, um, sometimes express astonishment that so many people do. Um, because when you log on to Twitter for the first time, if you don't know anything about it, it can actually be pretty confusing. It can be a little opaque. But people do use it, so we must be doing something right. I wanna talk about a couple of those things in particular. First, we think Twitter works um, because it's an information network and actually not a social network. The value that people say they get out of Twitter is the information they get out of Twitter. And that's information very broadly defined. But the point is, um, you're as likely to follow a news organization or a TV show or a journalist or a celebrity on Twitter as you are a uh, family uh, member or a friend. We actually have a term of art at Twitter. Um, we call it the one-way follow. And that indicates precisely these kind of relationships. So this isn't, you know, I follow Riyadh and Riyadh, Riyadh follows me back and we're friends. Or rather, it's I follow AJ English because I like what they tweet. I think it's valuable stuff all the time. And it actually turns out that these one-way follow relationships are really, really important dynamic for Twitter use. And in some ways, it actually resembles a TV broadcast. This is a classic one-to-many connection. Um, it has that same real-time urgency as TV. It has that same liveness as live TV. You know, you can miss something on TV, and in that same way, you can actually miss something on Twitter, and that's actually pretty interesting. And Twitter has something, had, Twitter has something else in common with TV, too. And this brings me to the second point. Um, Twitter works because there's very little friction. Friction. This is actually a word that we use a lot at Twitter headquarters in San Francisco. Uh, I guarantee that if you were to come and stop by and have lunch and just sort of hang out, you would hear this word um, all over the place. Less friction, less friction, less friction. It's almost like a mantra. Um, and that can mean a lot of things, but mostly to us it means less cognitive friction. Uh, it means you don't have to work to understand it. Um, 
if you stop and think about it, if you actually think about the experience of going to twitter.com or you know, using Twitter via SMS, uh, you realize there's not very much to understand. Um, there are no choices to make. There's basically no interface. There's no hierarchy, not really. There's no subjects, there's no sections. It's basically all stripped down to like pure message. Like the Director General of Al Jazeera said earlier today when we kicked this off, it's actually all about the message. And I think that's true. Okay, so there's very little friction, so what? I think that makes it easier for something like Twitter to ease in and become an organic part of a person's life in interstitial moments. You know, I'll bet actually more than a few of, here, of, of you here have stood in front of the elevators at the front of the hotel and sort of idly checked your Twitter feed while you're waiting for an elevator to arrive. And I know for a fact that more than a few of you are checking Twitter right now. Interstitial time, augmented time. This is all real time. It's in the moment, not in sort of special moments set aside. So this is where I branch out a little and go a little bit more broad than just Twitter specifically. You know, we say real time on a banner like that, and often we think immediately of like breaking news. Ah, it's urgent. Headlines, you know, make my phone beep and buzz, tell me now. I actually think that's the naive definition of real time. Instead, think about this. What if real time information is information that simply put fits into your life with no friction whatsoever? What if it presents itself whenever you want, you know, whenever it's convenient or interesting or useful, and what if it comes with no interface? Pure message. In other words, what if a person doesn't have to enter news mode? So this is how news has operated for a long time, whether you realize it or not. People always had to make time in their day. They always had to make time to enter news mode. They would read the paper over coffee in the morning. They would sit down for the evening news. You know, even today, you make time for newyorktimes.com. You make time for aljazeera.net. You are required to go into news mode. And I think that's all friction. So I'm gonna argue that news mode moments are actually going away. I think people are not really making that kind of time anymore. Uh, they're certainly making less and less. And one thing we know about the web is that just as water flows downhill, users flow away from friction. Now, if you work on the web, this is old news. If you don't work on the web, you should understand this. Um, we found this after a decade of user research now. People simply do not stop to puzzle things out. You know, they don't pause to understand the hierarchy of somebody's website. Um, they don't stop to sort of thoughtfully browse a table of contents and then make their choice. Instead, they just click whatever seems most right. They stumble around. They look for what seems like has, it has the, le the least friction. So maybe this is kind of rough to hear. I mean, we just, we just figured out websites. We have good websites now, finally. And so you, you know, I'm saying that news websites have too much friction. I am. Like Josh Benton said earlier today, uh, the average American spends less than 10 minutes a month on a newspaper website. And I can't imagine that it's like wildly more in different parts of the world. I think the power of now on that banner, I was looking at the banner, I've been looking at it all morning, kind of thinking like, what does that mean? The power of now, what could that mean? I think it's about presenting information in the flow of normal life without friction without an interface. And honestly, this is where this connection becomes really interesting, honestly, that begins to sound a lot like television. So that's very interesting given our, given our context here at Al Jazeera. And in general, TV has a really interesting resonance with Twitter. Um, both have these really real-time, live, sort of streaming characteristics. Both are actually very strongly social. Um, there's a deep satisfaction in doing what other people are doing at the same time, and that can be as true for following a conference hashtag on Twitter as it can be for watching the premiere of some show that you love. In, most in the most basic terms, we see TV shows appear on Twitter every night as trending topics, right? In some ways, this actually becomes the new programming guide. If until very recently, people used those grids on their TVs to sort of figure out what was on and what they ought to watch, now they look at Twitter. They see what their friends are tweeting about. They see what lots of people are tweeting about. That's how they discover content. That's how they decide what to watch. But even more interestingly to me, um, both TV and Twitter have essentially, if you think about it, no interface. They're pure content, pure message. There's no friction. You know, I'm 
using this iPad for my notes. And this is kind of this kind of the same thing, right? Maybe there's a macro trend here. There's almost no interface here. It's almost pure content. I don't know if you saw it, but just this week, Google announced Google TV at their I.O. conference in San Francisco, uh, where I live and where Twitter is headquartered. Um, in, in case you didn't see it, this is a new piece of software um, that basically makes TV work better. You can search TV programming and watch YouTube clips on your TV and all that stuff. And it was funny to watch um, because there was Google, you know, the internet giant, making this, this amazing, you know, impassioned pitch for the uh, continued importance of TV. It, it still has the biggest audience in the world, four billion people. Now, Al Jazeera knows this, of course. Out in Silicon Valley, we admit it only grudgingly. But it's true, TV is important. So now Google wants to change the operating system of television. It sounds very cool. Um, but I actually think there's a more immediate approach, um, one that doesn't require new software or fancy new TVs. And that's simply to change the way people find and talk about TV, the way they engage with TV programming. Um, it's already happening. You know, it's happening every day. It's happening right now on Twitter. If you search Al Jazeera, you'll see people talking about what they're watching. Um, we see this. But the opportunity remains, I think, to truly embrace it, um, to sort of showcase that real-time conversation on the TV itself. Twitter and TV, these things really do go together somehow. Um, it wasn't designed that way. It wasn't planned that way. But it's becoming clear over time. OK, so how does this argument about friction and about real-time media kind of apply to news in general across the board? Um, I think, of course, every news organization ought to be on Twitter. And you ought to be using Twitter to source stories. Um, but beyond that, I think it means that on any platform, in any system, you ought to be thinking about these things. You ought to be thinking about how you can present information in the context, in the interstitial parts of people's lives, in the right moment. Uh, you ought to be thinking about how you can present information without friction. You know, how can you make it insanely simple to find and consume news organically without ever having to enter news mode? How can you present information without an interface? How can you present pure content, pure message? I actually think this kind of analysis can be really, really powerful on any platform, in any region, certainly. Uh, Real-time information only works. It actually only happens as that friction approaches zero. And to tell you the truth, just about every news organization on every platform, even the really good ones, impose way, way, way too much friction today. So this is a challenge. And oddly, even though as a platform, as a medium, it's behind in some ways, um, TV might actually be out ahead in this regard. It's instantly understandable, right? Like nobody doesn't understand how to watch TV. No one gets confused by the UI of TV. It's pure message. So that's good news, and that's an opportunity if you're in the TV business. And finally, uh, I would say keep this in mind. At Twitter, well, I think we'd all agree Twitter, I've made the case Twitter's pretty simple. You should know that at Twitter, we think it's still way too complicated. Every single day, we're telling ourselves, oh, this doesn't make any sense. It's too complicated. There's too much friction. It's too hard to use. We're making it easier and easier and easier every day. We're working like crazy to do that every day. And I think, I think that you ought to be working like crazy in exactly the same way. Thanks. <laughs>